Uh, glad you uh, come be with us. Our first service of the new year. Um, and I guess many of us are hoping that this year is going to be a heap better than last. Um, although I was talking to Ms. Carolyn about this uh, earlier personally, last year wasn't that awful for me. Uh, I know last year it, it affected people in, in many different ways. Uh, um, you know, I guess uh, for us it wasn't, wasn't that bad. Like I said, it almost created an environment that I can thrive in to where I'm at home by myself most of the time. Um, it's good for me, no, it's not for everybody else, but I enjoyed it. Um, but you know, uh, with it being the first week of January and uh, people's already, so we're three days in, we're probably already halfway done with our New Year's resolutions, right? We got about what, another two or three days we're going to hold on to them and then we're done. New Year's resolution, that's just a to-do list for the first week of January is about the gist of it. Um, but within the, the new year starting out, there's uh, no doubt going to be many challenges and things we get to face. Uh, I know uh, right now one of the biggest decisions that people get to make is uh, uh, to take or not to take a vaccine. I know that's a topic of many people's conversations. There's lots of uh, a very strong, and I mean strong, opinions about it. Um, I'm not going to get into my opinion on those. And uh, uh, you, your choice is your choice. Your plans are your plans. Um, you know, I, it is what it is. Um, but it's also very much kind of going into a, a year that people might say there's still a lot of uncertainty that's out there. Um, you know, I, I, I wish we could look, you know, down the scope and we could see what's coming and we could know uh, how this year's going to wind up if we're going to be in this time of strangeness forever, if we're going to level off into normalcy or if, you know, we've done this for almost a year now, this kind of is normal so we shouldn't be looking backwards thinking that we wish things would be the way they used to be uh, because as Jason has taught us for the last several uh, weeks, um, you know, it's not going to be. It's just, it is what it is. It's just you know, the course of time that we have to travel through. It's a prophecy that we find in the Bible. You know, what we can read, it's, it's not looking like we're going back to normal. If we're going anywhere, we're going on to be with Christ. And that's just kind of uh, exactly how I feel in that manner. Um, but again, we enter into this year in a time of uncertainty. And a, you know, uh, people have a lot of anxiety now that never really had anxiety before. They were... Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's troubling. People uh, are uh, scared to death to get sick. People are scared to death to take a shot. People are scared to death to be in public. People are scared to do this. They're scared to do that. You know, they're um, it. It's really not a lot different than what we used to deal with. You know, we just uh, I, I was looking at numbers from uh, uh, statistics from. Uh, uh, the death toll from 2019 versus 2018. We had a global pandemic that was like the most deadly thing ever. The death tolls was like 150 different from 2018, what it was in 2019, and we had a, a, a pandemic. So I mean, a lot of uh, a fear that we have is, uh, um, you know, it's kind of in our mind, and we we, we have a bit of this anxiety. Uh, we're, you know, you really get to sit and thinking about it. Um, I could really worry myself sick thinking I could catch that, that mess again. Um, people who didn't have it bad, they don't care if you get it again or not. For me, um, I, I'm, I don't want it again uh, in no way, shape, form, or fashion. don't want nothing to do with it. Uh, corona is not welcome in my house. Um, but you could easily go down that road and scare yourself to death. And I know a lot of people do that. They just kind of stay trapped in this bubble of fear and it, it worries them to death. Uh, you know, you have enough to worry about as it is. You know, you got uh, uh, four kids to take care of. You got a job, you got bills, you got all these things that you got going on. You don't really have time to sit and worry about a whole lot. And uh, as you think of all the things that you could really stress and worry about on a normal basis, you know, it, it, it's we was talking about eating the hog jaw and whatnot for for the New Year's to bring good luck. And I was talking to mom the other night. I don't, 
I don't really buy into superstitions in any of, of any kind. Uh, I know people do, and to each their own, but I don't. Um, maybe that's because I've never really had a whole heap of good luck. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should start partaking in the black eyed peas. I don't know. Um, Knowing if it wasn't for bad luck, it wouldn't have no luck at all. Uh, that's just kind of the way it is. And I, I told the people I work with uh, early in the year, we was talking about the whole coronavirus. And they said, if you know, if anyone in our department is going to get it, it's going to be you. And I was like, I know. And I was talking to Miss Carolyn earlier. I said, you know, if I take that daggum vaccine, I'd be the one who grows an arm out my nose. That would just be my luck. You know, that's just the way it goes. But you, you think of all the things going on in the world and you, you, you go back through the, the events of last year and you look at what's still uh, culminating this year. You've got uh, supposedly some kind of giant rally they're wanting to have in Washington in a few days. You've got a, a transition of powers, uh, uh, things to be coming up this month. There's times of uncertainty, there's times of, uh, uh, of doubt, times of fear, times of all these things. But, you know, as Christian people, we were not called unto anxiety and doubt and fear we were called into joy and happiness that's really what we was uh, called into doing and, and that's what we're going to look at this morning because if there was anything I could desire of you in 2021 it would be that we uh, have a bit more joy and, and joy in doing uh, um, whatever it is that we do uh, if you if, if you want to stay inside our, our, our Clorox bubble, you know, be joyful in doing so. You know, just be happy in being you and be happy uh, uh, j just... Uh, you know, well, we talked about this a few weeks ago and it's kind of uh, uh, been brought up in, in uh, each message since. But, you know, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, we should be content wherewith we are. And if you open your Bibles up into the book of John this morning, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, actually we're going to try to talk a lot about joy, but we're going to have to talk about something entirely different to even get there. Um, and I'm going to do just a little bit of reading and a whole lot of jumping this morning. And on my Bible it's uh, nice because it's on the same page. But we're going to be reading from John chapter 14 and John chapter 15, but we're going to skip a whole lot in between. Does that make sense? Of course it does. Right? All right. Got your Bibles, open them up to the 14th chapter of the book of John. We're going to begin reading in uh, verse number 15, and then we're going to skip a long way over into John chapter 15, okay? So John chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible says this, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jump with me to John chapter 15, verse number 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you here this morning, God, we're again, we're thankful to be in your house, Father. We're thankful, Lord, for reading your words. Father, we're thankful, Lord, that you left us the instructions, Father, on how to, uh, to, to live and to have that happy life, Lord. We're just uh, 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 pleased, Lord, that to, and uh, just so grateful, God, for your, for, for your mercy, Father, for the peace, Lord, that you've given us, a uh, uh, peace that passes all understanding. Father, we're thankful for all the things, God, that you give us. But, Father, we just uh, pray, Lord, this morning that you would help us to do our part, Father, that you would help us to see and to understand. Understand, Lord, that uh, uh, you have all these things there to offer, Lord, but it's uh, uh, it's your people that need to do their part in receiving those blessings, God. We just ask you, Lord, that you would uh, uh, just help us to trust in you and uh, 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 increase our faith in you, Lord. Just help us to know that you are who you are. You are the great I am. You are the one that is in control. We uh, uh, spoke on faith uh, briefly in Sunday school this morning, Lord, but just help us to uh, to have that, Father, to, to rest in that faith, Lord, and knowing, Father, that uh, you sent the Comforter into us. You you have the spirit dwelling within us. You didn't leave us with nothing, God, that you give us everything uh, that we need and equipped us, Lord, uh, uh, fully to go forth and to live a, a happy and joyful life. Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to, to lean and trust unto you this morning. Father, Lord, just speak to us through your word. And we ask these things in your son Christ Jesus' name. And amen. Uh, and, and the reason why I, I started and jumped, because it's important for us to understand that if you love me, keep my commandments. Those are Jesus' words. It's something that I want us to wrap our minds 
minds around this morning that in loving God, it is keeping God's commandments. It is doing what he has asked us to do. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. And we understand we... It, I say we understand. We can't fully grasp God's love for us. We can't grasp and fathom the love that Christ had for you and I. It's hard for us to understand uh, someone who would leave glory, leave the place that we read on just a few minutes ago, to leave that, to come to a place like this, and to take on the sins of all humanity and give his life for all of us. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that. As parents, no doubt, we would give our life for our kids. Grandparents likely do the same thing for you grandkids, nieces, nephews, but for some stranger down the road that you have never seen, would you want to give your life for them? For those that drive you nuts and aggravate you, do you want to give your life for them? For those that, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, consciously you kind of have to think on this each and every day uh, that, that I put my uniform on, I go to school, I go back to school tomorrow, uh, kids and everybody to come back and join us on Tuesday, and, and believe it or not, there are kids in those buildings that really drive me nuts. There are teachers that it's really hard for me to tolerate. But part of my job is to ensure that they go home whether I do or not. Do you understand that? Even though I don't like them, I have a job to do. Amen. And if it was that day, if it was one of those bad days, again, my job is to ensure that they go home if it means I do not. Greater love hath no man than this to lay down your life for his friends. They ain't my friends. It's just what I get paid to do. There are patients, no doubt, that nurses take care of on a daily basis that drive them nuts and they probably don't really care for. But it's their job to provide them with that good quality of care. I know Ms. Carolyn spent uh, years working in hospitals. You probably didn't always have good patients. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around that kind of love. But if you love me, keep my commandments. And it says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments, and what was his father's commandment to do? It was to go to live that uh, perfect example of a life, to, uh, 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 to, to make that sacrifice for all of us. It says, uh, uh, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. Now think on this. As what we're uh, talking about and alluding to is what Christ done and accomplished for us. That was joy for him. Continue reading through the book of John. In the next few pages, you'll kind of get into uh, more of a triumphal entry. You, you'll see uh, uh, some of the great things and the welcoming party that was there. But then a few pages later, you see how all these people, there was a uh, uh, hallelujah, there's, uh, uh, the Messiah is here, the same ones that was crying out, crucify. That was a joy for him. That was a joy for Christ to come and accomplish the will of God. Even though the will of God meant that he was going to hang on the cross of Calvary. That was a joy. But it says, These things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now think on this. Your joy. God desires you and I to be happy. God does not desire us to just smile. God desires us to be joyful and to actually be happy. There are people that think the church house is the very place where the fake smile was invented. Amen. There are people that come in the back doors on a weekly basis. They give you the same grin, the same smile with nothing behind it. The only thing they show you is their teeth. Amen, preacher. They come in and it's a half-hearted grin, it's a half-hearted handshake, it's a half-hearted effort to do anything other than to come in, plop down in the pew, and sit there for two hours. And if it's a minute more than two hours, the smiles quickly go away and they turn into frowns and upset faces. I stand up here, I see them, don't lie to me and say they don't. 
I had somebody ask me one time, does it ever, you ever get discouraged when you see people start looking at their watches? I said, no, that really gives me more energy. So think on that the next time you give me one of those numbers. I mean, that's like an extra five minutes. God desires our joy to be full. In order for us to have joy and happiness in our lives, you have to remove the hate from your heart. Period. Bottom line, plain and simple. You can't be joyful and happy and hate everyone. Now the Bible tells us, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And we think on that as something that is like impossible because it, it is really hard to be like the Brady Bunch all the time, to always be happy and just uh, uh, solve every problem in a manner of just a few minutes. In a 30-minute show, you can solve the world's problem. It's really hard for us to imagine so, some ideal, uh, the, the ideal wife will always look at their kids and say, kids, your father's right. Jay, how often does that happen? It goes more like, kids, why would you ask your daddy that? You know he ain't never been right. Amen. It's kind of the way it goes. But we think of the people that have that kind of love as being fake. They're, they're pretenders. It's make-believe. You can't have that love. You can't love everyone. You can't be nice all the time. You can't just always turn your cheek because sometimes you got to cut your tongue loose. Sometimes you got to give somebody a lecture. Sometimes you really got to bless them out. Sometimes in order to make myself happy, I need to just explode on somebody. Sometimes. Well... You know, those of us Christians that have that mindset, read your Bible. Jesus walked into the temple one day and he flipped the tables over, spilled everything on the ground. He run the money exchangers out with a whip. Jesus, he, he looked at the scribes and the Pharisees and he said, Woe unto you, you hypocrites. Jesus called them out. It's not we go, we look at this and it's something that it is so hard for us to attain. You can't love everyone. We think that loving everyone means that we just have to be uh, overly happy and joyful all the time and just exuding, you know, uh, rainbows and smiles wherever we go. God did not call you and I to be fake. He called you and I to be joyful. And he told us to love one another. He told you and I to love one another. Letting someone live whatever kind of lifestyle they want, being okay with it, that's not love. It's not what it is because if you love your neighbor, you're going to be willing to correct your neighbor. If you love your family, you're going to be willing to call them out. If you love them, you will receive what they have to say. If you love them, you're not going to be yelling and fighting and arguing with one another because they said something that you don't agree with. People that love one another get this. They get their feelings hurt. And then do you know what they do? They talk about it like adults. They will say, excuse me, Matt, you have hurt my feelings. Because if you don't address the issue, the other party never knows there was an issue. They get to go on being happy and joyful. You live in misery. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Christ love us? Unconditionally. He loved you just the way you were. When God saved you, He saved you just the way you was. You didn't have to be anything different. He saved you as the sinner that you were, the sinner that you are, 
The same sin sick individual he saved. The most vile, evil, wicked person that you could ever imagine, he would save the exact same way as a child who's never really done a whole lot of anything. He loves you the same. So you think on love. Love is not something that is fake. It's not something that's imaginary. Love is not a look on your face. Love is not a word that you say. People say, I love you so often and they have no earthly idea what the meaning of the word means. You can never know what it's like to love someone until you have a knowledge and understanding of who Christ is. Then you can begin to realize what love is. I hear kids in the hallway all the time that say, I love you. I'm like, that's a joke. You don't even know what that is. This week you're going to love him. Next week you're going to hate him. And you're going to be loving this person over here. That is the life that I live. It's that never-ending cycle. But what is love? Everybody singing verse 2 of that song in your head now. You're picturing the night at the Roxbury. The guy standing there with a big thing over his head. What is love? Matt's got the bob going in his head. He knows what I'm talking about. Love is not a song. Love ain't a poem. Love ain't an expression on your face. Love ain't a four-letter word. That is not what love is. That is not what God has called us to do. He has not called us to walk in the back door to give a fake smile, half-hearted handshake to flop your hand out. Part of us thrive in this new uh, pandemic here because we don't like shaking hands anyways and you can just look at it. Corona, sorry. Don't shake hands no more. That's okay. You don't have to shake hands with someone to, for them to know that you love them. You don't have to uh, uh, smile. You don't have to do these things. Love is not those things. Love is not just a feeling, church. Love is an action. Love is a verb. That's what it is. And if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, we're going to look more in depth about love. Paul writes this out for us. He says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, charity being love in action, I am become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Hold that thought. We'll be back. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth nothing. Love is not what things you go through. It's not showing up in church. It's not giving uh, uh, $10 to the guy standing there at the end of the interstate holding the sign. That's not what love is. It's not a guilty feeling. Well, uh, uh, it may be this. Love is not judging the individual. Well, I would give him 10 bucks, but I know he's going to go over here and get in this Jaguar here in a minute and drive off down there to the liquor store and buy him some liquor because that's what we think in our minds. Love is not being judgmental. Love is seeing someone that could potentially have a need, whether you know they do or not, and giving to that need just for the fact that you could help. But we, we want to conditionalize everything. Well, I've been seeing this guy and I'm going to help him, but how I'm going to do it is, is I'm going to put him in my car and I'm going to, if he says he needs food, I'm taking him over here to the Wendy's and he will order him food and I'll pay for it. That's the only way I'm doing it. It's the only way I'm going to help him. It's going to be on my terms and it's going to be on my conditions. I, I know this family over here is in need, but I'm afraid that they're drug addicts. So this is the only way I'm going to help them. I'm going to give them a gift certificate to Jerry's. You know why I'm going to do it for Jerry's? Because they can't buy beer and they won't let them use it for tobacco or cigarettes. They can only use it for food. My terms, my conditions. That's the only way I'll do it. Friend, that ain't what love is either. Keep your money in your pocket because you ain't doing nobody no favors. You're not doing that for the love of your brother. You're not doing that uh, uh, for, for the kingdom of God. You're not doing that because Christ dwells in your heart. You're doing that to satisfy your own selfish desires. You're doing that to make yourself sound better. You're doing those things, as it says up here in the first verse that we read, to become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You're just doing it to make noise. Noise. 
How often does just noise annoy you? Does noise in here annoy anybody other than me? You ride down the road and the kids got like 30,000 drinks and cups in whatever vehicle we're driving. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. And lo and behold, there's always going to be a can or one of them uh, big heavy metal things like this that makes good noise. It's always sitting in a cup holder on top of like three quarters and two nickels. And they rattle constantly going down the road. And after about five miles, I've had it. And I'm about to explode. And I start looking. I'm driving. I don't care what's going on around me. I'm looking. Mindy already knows to find the noise. There's a noise somewhere. And she knows husband is about at his wit's end. Remove the noise. Back in La La Land. Turn the radio back up. I can go back to having my concert in my own little world driving down the road. All's well. Them dadgum seatbelt things the most annoying things they've ever put in a car. If I wanted to wear my seat belt, I would click it. You know what I'm saying? I don't need my car to annoy me every 30 seconds. All right? That drives me nuts. It is that noise that is nothing but annoying. And it is annoying to everyone in the car because even the passenger that's wearing their seat belt, they're annoyed with you because you won't put it on. I get in my lieutenant's car. We'll be going, we leave the police department and we're going to be heading towards the square. And about the time that we get to the chocolate factory, I catch this. And that means, because he's annoyed with the sound too. It's funny, I don't hear it in the passenger seat. I only hear it when you're driving. I don't think I've ever heard the seatbelt dinger from the passenger seat. It's like they put the speakers right in the driver's ears. It's funny how that happens. Preacher, what does any of that have to do with love? Because I'm trying to get you to understand what a sounding of brass and a tinkling cymbal and annoying sound is. I'm trying to get you to understand what something that is just fake. If we stood up here with cymbals and just clanged them the whole time that uh, a singing or Sunday school preaching was going on, that would annoy you. It is something that is just happening for no purpose whatsoever. It is just something that is happening. Friend, that's what most of our love for our brothers is. Something that's just happening. But that's not what love is. Paul tells us exactly what love is. He says it doesn't matter what you do. It don't matter how much faith you have. It don't matter that you have the faith that can move mountains. It doesn't matter that you give your last dollar to whoever has it. None of that matters if you're doing it without love in your heart. My Bible gives this definition of charity. It says selfless, sacrificial concern for the welfare of others. It is love without conditions and without reservations. That's what love is. Paul goes on to explain it. And the word charity here, and that's just too much for some people to wrap their mind around, so for today's purposes, just say love. It says, And though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. It says, Love suffereth long, Love lasts. If you actually are going to tell somebody that you love them, but then they wrong you in some way, and then a few weeks later you say, you're dead to me, I'm done with you, you never loved them to begin with. Amen. You didn't. You might have had a little funny feeling in the pit of your stomach about them, but you didn't love them. Love, it suffereth long, and is kind. Love is kind. How many people in here are kind? How many people are kind to others? How many people in here are continue to be kind no matter the circumstance? Jamie and I worked at Pizza Hut on Sundays like throughout our, the whole time we was in high school. You never found kind people on the Sunday buffet. 
People, they, they put on them smiles when they come into church house. They might even give you a firm handshake. But you put mushrooms on their pizza when they said no mushrooms, kindness is out the window. Kindness goes away. The people are not kind. You have wronged me in some way. I no longer have to show love unto you because I have been wronged. So love suffereth long. It endures. It's patient. It's something that uh, uh, is, uh, uh, no matter what's going on, they're going to be patient in the situation. They're going to be patient with the individual. They're going to show that kindness. Charity suffereth long and is kind, and charity envieth not. Charity don't say, well, wish I had that. You know, I might could love too if I had what you had. If I was raking down six figures a year, I could be happy, yeah. I could do those things. I could be happy with that. No, you couldn't because godliness with contentment is great gain. Keep remembering that. That is important for you and I to have that contentment because without contentment, we're not ever going to have the, the happy and the joy and the love that we're not even going to be able to show. How many times a week do you say, I wish I had... Or I wish in some form of something that someone else has. You see somebody driving a new vehicle down the road. Wish I had one of those. You hear so-and-so who just uh, bought a new house. I wish I could buy a new house. You look at so-and-so who has a farm. I wish I had one of those. You look at this. I wish I had that. I wish, I wish, I wish. Charity and love envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up. Let me read the next one here. I want to skip the next one. I'm going to go, Charity seeketh not her own. Because the vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up and seeketh not her own. Those three are going to go together. Because that's going to take you out of the equation. Having love and charity is not about you. If you consider yourself in the equation, then love is not in there. Love is selfless. It is not something that, uh, well, I would help, but see, I have all these needs. I have this going on. You know, I, I, I'd love to come help you, but, you know, I, I've got to go get my dog a bone. You know, it's just the it's just way it is. We come up with some kind of useless excuse to put us in the way. Love is... Vaunteth not itself, it is not puffed up, and it seeketh not her own. It's not about you. You're not doing it just so you can post it on Facebook and say, look what I did. You're not doing it so you can tell the world. You not got your selfie stick holding up here while you're handing the bum $20. That way you can take the picture and send it to all of humanity. That's not why you did it. That's not what love is. Love isn't the story that you tell on your social media. Love is not about you and it's not about telling everybody else what you have done. It's not about that. Church, I can't uh, stress to you enough that love is not about you at all. It says it does not behave itself unseemingly. Let me read on down here because we're going to put these two together. It says love does not behave itself unseemingly. It is not easily provoked. It thinketh no evil and it rejoiceth not in iniquity. All those things you're going to lump together. You're not going to smile when you say someone gets what they deserve and claim to have love in your heart. Well, they had it coming to them. That's what they get. How many times do you say that? How many times do you say that a week? Well, that's what they get. You play with fire, you're bound to get burned. What did they think was going to happen? Church, that's not love. You might be telling them the truth, but you're not telling them with love behind it. That's not love is not saying, I told you so. 
Love is not happy when you see people go through bad things. Love is not about that. It says, it's not easily provoked and behave itself unseemingly. Love ain't party it up when you think nobody's looking. Love is not living the life, any kind of lifestyle that you desire and presenting yourself uh, uh, to be the fake person on Sunday morning. That's not what love is. Why are these things important? Because I want you to be happy, church. It would tickle me to death to come to church one Sunday and you guys sit there and actually smile. As you go through the pews, it's like you can tell what time people went to bed. I could probably have a, a safe estimation just by going through the pews of what time you went to bed. I can look at you and I can probably tell with pretty good assumption as to who actually eat breakfast. I can tell you who had their coffee. I can tell you who's happy to be here and who showed up. It's like... You guys should really stand up here sometime. You guys, should, one at a time, just take turns sitting up here. Just, just to go through it. You know when you read it, and I think it's in Jeremiah, and it says don't look at their faces, there's reason for that. Yeah. It's not easily provoked. Sometimes I don't think it'd take much push for me to go postal and become a terrorist. I really don't. I tell many of this all the time. People absolutely drive me nuts. I'm not the only one in here that people drive nuts. Right? I drive a lot of you guys nuts. Guarantee it. I can tell by the look on your face I drive me nuts. Preacher, by you saying that, we know that you don't have love in your heart. No, it's not about that. You're making excuses, preacher. No, I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm trying to be as transparent with you as I can be. People drive me nuts. You want to test the smarts of an individual? Put blinking lights in front of them and you stand in the road and attempt to direct traffic. You can see that most people that drive don't have an IQ of a goose. I'm telling you the honest truth. It's hard. Church, I'm not trying to tell you things that ain't true. I know how hard it is to love people. Some people are hard to love. But we're thinking on this in a manner that you have to have that warm and fuzzy feeling about everybody. It's not. Because you can love people that you may not really like. You can love people that you can't really get along with. Because love is the action that is there. It is the sincerity that is within it. It does not behave itself unseemly and the sake of their own. It is not easily provoked and it thinketh no evil. It says, Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but it rejoiceth in truth. Church, I've told you a bunch of truths today. Things that should make us happy. You know, as Jason is teaching Sunday school and we're going through the new heaven and the new earth, that should make your heart well up. You should be emotional in thinking on these things. When you hear that somebody has gotten saved, you should well up on the inside. That should make you emotional because that means that there truly is love and joy in your heart for others. Even if it's someone that you don't like and you hear good things have happened, you should be happy on the inside because you are rejoicing for them. You're happy for them. You're happy in them, sir. You're glad that they got these things. It should not always be an Eeyore attitude. It says, love beareth all things. Made reference to this other, or earlier. You're not going to say, I love you, and then a few weeks later be done with somebody. Don't even care. You never loved them. 
Think of all these things in relation to Christ. What if Christ had all these stipulations for you and I? Just, let's take two. What if God's love wasn't long-suffering, and what if God's love didn't bear all things? Where would we be? I can tell you it's in a place called hell. It's exactly where we would be. God's love is overwhelming. God's love is something that we can't fathom and understand. God's love means that you leave 99 good sheep to go look for the one that went astray. That's what God's love is. It's, it, 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 it don't make sense to us. That's why it's hard for us to show that love to others. But it says, love beareth all things, love believeth all things, love hopeth all things, and love endureth all things. Preacher, the only way you could be that kind of person is to be so naive. No. No, that's not it. It says, charity never faileth. You understand that? Love in action doesn't fail. It says, where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall fail. They shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. You know how we talked last week that as time goes by, people die. And it's like the next generation can't remember the previous. All those things that was there, these things are going to vanish away. If the world lasts long enough, there will no longer be people who has the good knowledge and working knowledge and remembrance of God's Word. You mark my words, it's... You find that within God's Word, it can happen, it will happen. But people that actually love one another, that will endure. Because you're going to help somebody out out of the kindness of your heart. The Bible says this in 2 Thessalonians, it says, And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient." Waiting for Christ. Why is it important for you to love others? Why is it important that when you're out and about that you have love for one another? Because that's what Christ did. And He's our example. What happens if you've overslept and you got uh, whatever going on on a Monday morning? You're running late. You spilled your coffee all over your pants. You stepped in a big pile of dog poo. That always ruins everybody's day, does it not? You still love people on those days too. You love people because you need to be loved. You love people because you know what it's like when someone just showed up out of the blue just right on time. You love people because God loves you. And God loves you just the way you are. God's love wasn't conditional. Well, when you get to this point, I'll love you. When you get to this point, I'll save you. God loves you in the very state you came in today. Stand together with me this morning. Jesus said this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says on the opposite page of my Bible, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. You go back and you study what everybody refers to as the love chapter. You study 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You read and you, 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 you take each individual part of what Paul is saying. And you study that through yourself. You look at that through your heart. Church, this is more for me than it is for any of you. 
God desires us to love one another. He don't desire us to smile. He don't desire us to wave. He don't desire, desire us to just look happy. He wants us to be full of joy and to have love for one another. Let's bow together and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you here today, God, we... we we know, Lord, that uh, we love you, Father. We, uh, we, we say with our minds and we say with our hearts, Lord, that we love you, Father. But it's not always with our lives that we say that. It's not always in our attitude. It's not always in our prayers. Lord, we just pray, God, that this day, Father, that you would look at us, Father, that you would see us exactly how we are. Father, that you would help us to see ourselves the same way. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us as we look out at the world, Father, as we go out and we live our lives this week, as we go and we do, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would give us your eyes, that you would help us see, Father, from your perspective, from your point of view, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us, God, to show the love to others that you have for us, Father, we, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see that we don't deserve mercy, but yet you gave it, Father. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to see that even though someone else, they may have wronged us, Lord, that you, you would, Father, just give us the ability, Father, and, and desire in our hearts to show that mercy to others as well. Father, we just pray, Lord, that uh, we would get ourselves out of the way, that we wouldn't do things, Father, just for a show, Father, to, uh, to, for it to be, to, to be seemingly, Father, for, uh, it just uh, to, to make us look good or because someone's looking or, well, uh, you know, I'm part of the church. This is what I'm supposed to do. Father, we pray that you'd help us to, to just get rid of that attitude, Father, and put your love deep within our hearts, Father, in the desire Lord, to go forth and to serve our brothers, Father, just to, uh, to be a willing vessel, Father, just to be the helping hand, Father, to do it just because, Father, help us take us out of the way, Father, and, and only focus upon you and, Father, your will and the things that you would desire us to do, Father, then the love comes natural. It comes uh, easy for us, Father, if we're living our lives according to your will. Lord, we just pray that you just watch over us, lead God, and direct and bless us this year. Father, we pray, Lord, that here at Oakdale, Father, that it, uh, this new year, Father, as long as we're here, Father, that we would be centered in your will, Father, in doing, God, what you would desire us to do, Father. Uh, help us, Lord, just to fill this house, God, uh, with your love, Father, so that it spills out into our community, Father, and it's a shining light for all those that, uh, that, that are around, Father, and that we encounter. Lord, we ask all these things in your Son, Christ Jesus' name, and amen.